Welcome to the Council of Trend Podcast, a production of Catholic Answers. Welcome back to Free For All Friday here at the Council of Trent Podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. Monday, Wednesdays, it's Catholic Theology. But on Friday, we're free. Freedom to talk about whatever I want to talk about and whatever you care to listen to. And today I want to talk about some secrets and interesting stories that are related to the topic of nuclear radiation. Now, I had talked about nuclear radiation a little bit in my episode where I was freaked out about nuclear war because of when Russia in invading Ukraine. Uh, but so today I'm not going to really talk about nuclear war and fallout prep and, and those kinds of things. I'm going to talk about things that are related to nuclear radiation that you might not be as familiar with, but I find to be utterly fascinating. So that's what I want to get off to today. Uh, so, of course, nuclear radiation, I mean, radiation is just the emission of energy as waves or particles. There's all kinds of radiating energy. Now, there's all kinds of nuclear radiation. I mean, uh, we experience this kind of radiation. There's low, le low levels of it that we experience. According to the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, there's all kinds of sources for natural uh, background radiation. Uh, cosmic radiation, we'll talk about that a little here at the end of the episode. Uh, terrestrial radiation uh, that comes from things here on the Earth uh, that exist naturally in soils or rocks. Uh, air contains radon, which is responsible for uh, small natural amounts of radiation that people receive. Uh, and all people have internal radiation from radioactive potassium-40 and carbon-14 inside of their bodies. So what makes radiation hazardous, of course, is the dosage. Uh, and there are things that can emit uh, high levels of radiation that uh, end up uh, causing you to have radiation sickness. Um, a great miniseries on that is the Chernobyl miniseries. I think that was HBO. I can't entirely remember. I remember watching it with my wife, but we don't have HBO, so I don't know where it aired. But the Chernobyl miniseries, they do a great job explaining. They talk about radiation particles are like these little molecular bullets that shred through your body uh, that come from, you know, especially from things like radioactive carbon fission rods, uh, things, or not the carbon rods themselves, but the, the radioactive material that takes, that is in uh, nuclear uh, reactors in plants like Chernobyl, though the carbon rods themselves and others after the reaction, after the explosion at Chernobyl were uh, highly radioactive, everything there was. Uh, so today, though, once again, I'm not, not, not talking about nuclear disasters, not talking about nuclear war. I'm going to talk about other things you may not be as familiar with. Uh, here's one that's interesting when it comes to nuclear radiation. So to create devices that are very sensitive to locate radiation, you have to get material that's free of radiation. So this would be things like Geiger counters, uh, things that you use to detect radiation levels. Uh, using uh, very sensitive equipment to, to detect radioactivity in space aircraft, the equipment itself must be free from radiation. Now, you might think, oh, well, that shouldn't be that hard to um, you have stuff that's free of radiation. But it isn't because radiation is common all over the Earth. And in particular, since the 1940s, Ever since the nuclear tests in the 1940s, they changed the world's atmosphere. Uh, so they released into the air radionuclides called uh, cobalt-60 that uh, give off a very weak radioactive signature. And so the bombs like Trinity in New Mexico and Hiroshima, uh, sorry, the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and of course all the other nuclear bombs that were detonated afterwards, but even those, they, they changed the composition of cobalt-60 in the air, and the creation of steel that would be used in the machinery to detect radiation, the problem is that steel, at least older steel, was created through a process that would force air into converting iron into steel. And so, but even afterwards, unless you create the steel in a environment completely sealed off in a vacuum, completely sealed off from outside air, uh, you will get low levels of cobalt-60 in it. So you get tiny, because of these nuclear bombs that detonated decades ago, 
any steel that is is manufactured after 1945 has trace amounts of cobalt-60 in it because it's just up there in the air. It's spread all throughout the earth. And so you can't make steel that's free of that particular radionucleotide? What is it? It's, um, or sorry, a radionuclide. The point is, there's low levels of radioactivity in steel. It's not harmful to us, but the steel itself can't be used in a device to try to find any radioactivity because it has a tiny, tiny amount of radioactivity. So it's only for very sensitive equipment. Uh, You need to find steel that doesn't have cobalt-60 in it. So what do you do? Where do you find this? Here's the ingenious thing to find steel that is radioactive-free, right? Think about it. Where would you go on the Earth to find steel that has not been exposed to air after 1945? And the answer is, uh, you can find it in sunken ships. So this is called low background steel. And one way to find it is to go, uh, there are uh, harbors and areas in England and the North Sea. Uh, People have also gone uh, to the South China Sea and the Java Sea, areas where uh, ships that were constructed in like the 1920s and 1930s, even going back to the 19th century, You have ships that were constructed out of steel, and the steel was created before 1945, so it doesn't have cobalt-60. And because the ship was at the bottom of the ocean, uh, it was protected from uh, the radiation cobalt-60 that was released into the air after the nuclear events. And also it's been protected from radiation, uh, from just a lot of natural background radiation, like the sun isn't shining on it. Uh, It's very well preserved. And so that kind of steel... It was actually very expensive, as you would imagine, trying to get a hold of. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, I always thought that was neat. Like, where, where can we find this kind of stuff? And there it's, oh, you know, we have steel at the bottom of the ocean just waiting to be harvested to be used uh, for that, um, that purpose. So that's interesting. Here's another story. Uh, I believe uh, Jimmy Aiken at Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World has talked about this because Jimmy talks about all kinds of weird things that both of us have, have in common. We enjoy weird stories. And this one is called the Radioactive Boy Scout, the Nuclear Boy Scout. It's the story of David Hahn. David Hahn, he was a nuclear radiation enthusiast who built a homemade neutron source at the age of 17. It says here, a scout in the Boy Scouts of America, Hahn conducted his experiments in secret in a backyard shed at his mother's house in Commerce Township, Michigan. Han's goal was to build and demonstrate a homemade breeder reactor. That's something that creates more fission material than it uses. And while he never managed to build a reactor, uh, he did create a neutron-producing source, a radioactive source. And the police noticed it when they uh, saw the materials in his vehicle. They stopped him for an unrelated matter. Uh, He told them the material was radioactive, so they contacted the authorities And the Environmental Protection Agency set up what's called a Superfund cleanup site. They use that in places where there's been toxic waste, nuclear waste to clean up and and raise it to the ground. Although he eventually did attain the role of Eagle Scout shortly after his lab that he had created was dismantled. So this guy was just obsessed with radiation. And even later in life, he got in trouble for uh, larceny of smoke detectors. This is in 2007. Uh, Han was charged with larceny in Michigan for removing a number of smoke detectors from the halls of his apartment building to obtain americium from them. Uh, In his mugshot, his face is covered with sores, could have been from radioactive materials or possible drug use. And so he pled guilty to attempted larceny of the building. About nine years later, at the age of 39, uh, he died from an accidental result of intoxication from alcohol, uh, diphenhydramine, and fentanyl. So sad story for sure, but it's just so interesting that he just got obsessed with radiation as a kid and wanted to build his own radioactive lab, and that probably could have caused mental illness or radiation sickness, and it's sad, it just kind of followed him for the, for the rest of his life, basically. Uh, but that was interesting one, if you ever heard of that. You can look it up. Jimmy, I'm sure, goes into great a lot more detail than I have. Check out Mysterious World, the Radioactive Boy Scout, which sounds like a superhero name, and then you hear the story, it's actually, it's actually really sad. But, I mean, he's smart and ingenious. He built a neutron source in his mom's backyard, so, I mean, he's he was a smart guy. He went on to work in the Navy and the Marine Corps. I, I think he might have been an engineer, but it just it all just kind of caught up with him. All right, here's the next one. Uh, when you think of nuclear accidents, you usually think of Chernobyl, right? Like nuclear power plants. 
But some of the most dangerous nuclear accidents are actually at nuclear radiation therapy centers, at hospitals. Uh, One of these is the Zaragoza incident. This was in 1990 at a clinic in Spain, in Aragon, Spain, the clinic of Zaragoza. There was an accident where 27 people were injured and 11 of them died. They were cancer patients receiving external beam radiotherapy. So they get this uh, uh, beam that shoots uh, concentrated uh, radiation. It's a form of radiation therapy, you know, to treat cancer, you know, things, things like that. Uh, and of course, it's also it's always dangerous. Even when you go to the, the dentist, right, they'll step out of the room and put, they put a lead apron on you and turn on the x-ray. And that's just x-ray radiation, not concentrated nuclear radiation. And this stuff is safe when it's done correctly. But the problem was, December 7th, 1990, a technician perform maintenance on an electron accelerator at the clinic of Saragossa. It was returned to service after the repairs, uh, but he had repaired it improperly, and I believe the setting was too high. Uh, Affected patients immediately, they would suffer burns on the skin of their irradiated areas and inflammation of internal organs. Uh, And so I guess people, it took a while for them to realize connecting to the machine and what what was going on. Uh, but 11 of the deaths were related to faulty maintenance of this electron accelerator. And so that's classified. When you look at radiation incidents, uh, more people died from this nuclear accident at the Clinic of Zaragoza than at the Fukushima nuclear plant or Three Mile Island or other nuclear plant accidents. These radiation therapy units, it's, it can be quite dangerous. Uh, a similar one is in Guyana, Brazil, 1987. It was called one of the worst nuclear disasters, and the disaster was that at an abandoned hospital, they had left a radiotherapy source. It was a device. Let me see the device. It was a teletherapy radiation capsule, and so the capsule, it contained, I want to say cesium, uh, or cesium, cesium, cesium-137, a radio uh, isotope uh, encased in lead and steel, and it was at an abandoned site. The hospital ended up being abandoned. And then thieves broke in, and they it says on September 13, 1987, there was a guard guarding this hospital site to keep dangerous materials from being stolen. Uh, and it said the guard was not on duty that night because he took his family to see the movie Herbie Goes Bananas. You know, who also goes bananas, the Brazilian authorities letting radiation stuff get stolen. And then uh, uh, four people died and 249 people were contaminated because thieves stole it. They opened it up. They're like, oh, what's this stuff? They see this glowing blue stuff inside. Oh, my goodness. So, but, but the exposure of it, even though only four people died, thousands, uh, about 112,000 people were examined for radioactive contamination. And so here, that's just one radiotherapy device kept at a hospital. So really, radiation, it's not so much power plants. They, they got it at clinics and things like that. You have to be... Watch out for. All right, last one. Not so much a downer. I had one interesting, two downer stories. This one's more uplifting or scientific-y. That's not a word, but I don't care. It's interesting. This is about cosmic microwave background radiation. So remember I said cosmic radiation earlier in the show? Well, this is a really interesting thing. So back when people were debating whether the universe began with a big bang, uh, Father Georges Lemaitre, Catholic priest, said yes, Albert Einstein said, it's a beautiful theory, but there's no, where's the empirical evidence? But then in the 1960s, uh, Arno Penzias, I think Robert Wilson, were using a a Bell Labs radio telescope to examine the universe. They were picking up radio transmission, and they got a faint signal no matter where they pointed the telescope. They thought that birds had pooped on the telescope again, and they cleaned it. And when they did, they pointed all around, and they found this same faint radiation. And this was confirmed to be radiation, a heat signature from the Big Bang. Universe began with a Big Bang, very hot expansion, and it left this uh, faint radiation signal all throughout the entire observable universe, this electromagnetic radiation. And this later confirmed Father Lemaitre's theory that was derided, it was made fun of. The word Big Bang was kind of a slur back then, uh, coined by the atheist now, and then later he became a deist uh, scientist, Fred Hoyle. Uh, Father Lemaitre's theory was confirmed, and then later there was a, a probe that was sent out, or a, a satellite, I think it was sent out in the 1990s, that mapped this, the, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP, is what, I wanna, is what I'm thinking of. 
so yeah, and so that was a uh, very important discovery in cosmology, confirmation of the Big Bang. Very fascinating, the cosmic microwave background radiation that they, the heat of the Big Bang, it, it cooled, but then expanded and filled the entire universe. The entire universe was filled with this. Why am I French? I do not know. But if I did a documentary, it would fill the whole universe. I apologize to our listeners in France. I did not mean to appropriate your culture or offend you with a terrible French accent. Hey, that was fun. Thank you guys so much for listening. And I hope that you have a very blessed day. If you like today's episode, become a premium subscriber at our Patreon page and get access to member-only content. For more information, visit trenthornpodcast.com.